Welcome to the Questions for Christians TV show. In this series, I ask Christians who are involved in some kind of leadership uh, about their views on different topics in uh, philosophy and theology and science. Today, my guest is Jason Burns. He's a street preacher and YouTube preacher based in Manchester, UK. It's uh, almost 4 a.m. there, so I um, appreciate him calling in, and hopefully we have a good, clean uh, phone connection. We're going to talk about five subjects for about 10 minutes each. I asked Jason to suggest the topics he feels most competent about and things that I would agree as far as being interesting to the atheist and Christian communities. So here's the five that he came up with. Uh, number one is the Bible, the Word of God. Number two are the Gospels, good historical sources for learning about the life of Jesus. Number three, does Christianity provide a basis for science? Number four, who was Jesus? And number five, is the gospel relevant today in our modern world? Uh, my name is Bernie Daler. I was an evangelical born-again Christian for over 25 years, and prior to that I was raised as a Roman Catholic. I have a bachelor's degree in electronics engineering technology from Oregon Institute of Technology. Got that in 1984. In 2007, I earned a master's in ministry degree from Luther Rice Seminary in Georgia. It's a Baptist seminary. And then in 2009, I left the faith and became an atheist. I also wrote a booklet called Modern Science and Philosophy Destroy Christian Theology to help share my ideas. Today, my guest is Jason Burns. He's a street preacher and YouTube preacher based in Manchester, UK. If you ever saw one of those street preachers and you wondered what it might be like to have a conversation with them, well, maybe today uh, we'll give you a flavor for that. Jason, uh, welcome to the show. And I'd like to give you uh, a minute to explain who you are and what you do to people who have never heard of you before. Hi, Bernie. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for having me on. It's a, it's a privilege. Um, my name's Jason Burns. I live in Manchester. Um, I do evangelism up and down the UK, especially in university, universities where I talk with students. And uh, I'm also currently involved in church planting. Uh, I have a degree from uh, Nazarene Theological College, uh, which is accredited by Manchester University. And I've been in academic theology studies for over 10 years, studying at Luke the King House at MA level in Islam, Hinduism, and postmodernism. Um, uh, and that's me. And I, I, I just love Jesus. I want to share Jesus. With, that's what I want to do with my life. And, uh, and I just appreciate the opportunity for dialogue conversation. Okay, and, and uh, what is your website? Do you want to give that out? Uh, my website is uh, jasonburnspreacher.com, jasonburnspreacher.com. And if you go on my website, you'll get a, 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 an understanding of who I am as a person and, and my position on things. There's lots of resources there, academic uh, resources, practical resources about Christianity uh, for Christians and academic resources for anybody who wants to uh, investigate Christianity. And what about your YouTube channel? What can you say about that? Um, if you go to my website, you can get to my YouTube channel and, and Twitter and face, Facebook from my website. But uh, Samuel's in the Theological Seminary YouTube channel is my main channel for uh, lectures that I've done. And it's just an online resource for free theological education. And then my own channel, uh, Jason Burns, you can link to that uh, from, um, from my website. There's so many uh, channels up of me and some of those channels are nothing to do with me that people have set up so okay. better to go to my website and you mentioned you have a degree what degree was that again uh, my degree is a, a BA honors in theology and pastoral studies it was four years full time okay um, I also pastor churches as a Baptist minister and a free church minister okay so you have a BA in theology so you should know something about Christian theology right Yes, yes. Okay. All right, so we're ready to start our sections with that. Okay, for 10 minutes. The first question is, is the Bible the Word of God? Uh, did you want to start with that, or did you want me to start? I have some things I'd like to talk to you about also. And, and by the uh, way, this is meant it, to be a, a dialogue, so let's try to okay. keep it as a dialogue. Okay. It's up to you, Bernie, whatever you want to do. Well, I mean, is the Bible the Word of God? Um, I can give you 
I, I got four things to say. Number one, I don't believe God exists, so of course not. It's the Word of God. I don't think it's the Word of God. Number two, I would say, what does Word of God even mean? Because obviously, even you don't believe it's the literal Word of God as far as, you know, words from God's mouth. Because like the Muslims, for example, they say the Quran is the Word of God, and these words eternally existed, and they're the exact words. And I don't think you're going that far even for what the Word of God is. And then um, I wanted to, if we have time, I wanted to give a quote from N.T. Wright, who I know is your, one of your favorite scholars. And he talks about why he's not a Bible inerratist. And I don't know if you're an inerratist or not, but I thought that might be an interesting discussion. So I'll start with that and, and see how you respond. Okay. Um, well, I think from, for me, from my understanding, is um, uh, Bertrand Russell, um, if I remember rightly, I've just had a quote. Oh, sorry, I... I um, Bertrand Russell says uh, that, that man is a product of causes which has no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes, his fears, his loves, his beliefs, about the outcome of accidental coalition of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, that all labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genuine are destined to extinction, and the whole temple of man's achievements must inevitably be buried. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Bertrand Russell, why I'm not a Christian. And for me, the reason why I be believe the Bible is it gives me an understanding of history, an understanding of logic, an understanding of morality, where there is meaning, where if I took your position, I would end up what Russell says, and that everything has no meaning, and everything's pointless. Well, you know, I mean, a couple of ideas I have. I mean, first off, I think we have to believe what is true. So if what Bertrand Russell said is true, I, I don't think we can say, like, well, let's not do it. Let's believe the Bible instead because it makes me feel good. I think we want to agree that we have to follow what's true. Yeah, but even it, but if we grant your position and if we grant Russell's, there is no truth because there is no meaning, there is no purpose. There's the Christian position, if you believe the Bible, where it says, it says in uh, Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walketh in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the Lord, law of the Lord, and, and in the Lord that we meditate day and night. If we believe that, to believe it, there's a rational basis because it's saying there's a God, there's a law. Uh, and what that means is if there is a God, for example, it gives the basis for rationality. For example, if, there's, if, there, if, there, um, if there are no... I've got a, 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 an argument here. Is if there are no logical absolutes without God, we have logical absolutes, therefore there is a God. Well, okay, so but, it, but, but hold on a second. We're going off the, we got to make sure we only have 10 minutes here, and our, our, our question is supposed to be about the Bible. Is the Bible the Word of God? And now we're going off on morality and objective morals. No, 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 because the Bible, no, because the whole point is, is that Russell is saying there's no meaning to history. The Bible is saying that there is this God and that there is this law, and that is the foundation of, of Christianity, that there is a God, there is law. And then there is Christ. That's the basic foundation. And and if you take that presupposition, God, that presupposition helps you to understand why we have logic, why we have reason. It, it helps us to understand why we have morality. And your position, this position of evolution, which you bang on about, and which Russell is, is is trying to bring out the implications, doesn't give any meaning or purpose to rationality or morality or anything like that. So when you're attacking the Bible. You've got no rational foundation. You've got no moral foundation to do that. Well, I think I have a moral yeah. foundation. I don't think it's that complicated to understand. I, I don't think you need more God for morals at all, and I don't think it's complicated. Well, you, I have a example, foundation. If God does not, well, well, the thing is, the thing is, you've not dealt with the argument about logical absolutes. No logical. Uh, there can be no logical absolutes without God. We have logical absolutes, therefore there, there is. God. And for example, you, you admitted uh, in our last discussion 
that um, a lot of non-contradictions in material. And you're a naturalist. And as a naturalist, you don't want to admit that the physicality of your position and connect the dots between immaterial logic and physicality. So, for example, if I believe that the God, if I believe the Bible, and it tells me there's a God, and then I'm trying to think about what rationality is, it helps me to connect the dots. If God's rational, and it helps me to understand that why logic is immaterial, and why we can have logical absolutes. Whereas you're going to attack the Bible, criticize the Bible, say things about the Bible, but you're going to use reason to do that, yet you can't account for reason. You're going to attack the Bible on morality, but yet you can't account for morality, because in your situation, you've got two problems. You've got one problem is that nature doesn't tell you what moral, moral absolutes are. So you have the problem, what is called, that is all distinction. Wait, wait a second, it's wait a moral. second, wait a second. We're, we're getting away from a discussion. I mean, you're kind of going into a lot of, I don't know, maybe a sermon or a one-way discussion here. Why don't you ask me a question or something about the Bible being the Word of God? I mean, I, let me ask you this. Number one, do we both agree that the, at the bottom line, we have to follow what's true. If the Bible, if the Bible is not true, if, if God does not exist, we need to accept that. We agree with that, right? But, if you, but you're assuming what, that there is truth. Of course I'm assuming there's assuming. truth. I have but, no problem but, 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 no, you, because, no, because, no, because in, in, if you read Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason, he, dealt, he had to deal with two issues. He had to do, deal with evidence, and he had to deal with presupposition. So what you like to do, what I've noticed with you, Bernie, I've, I've listened to about eight of your messages today and debates and things. You don't like to get into these kind of issues because you, you like just to push them to the side, and you can't push them aside. You can't, you can't assume rationality. You can't assume morality from your, your doctrine. Your basic uh, uh, apologetic in all what you do is basically you use evolution. Evolution is your battery, man. That's your foundation. Now, if that's your foundation, you've got to live logically to that foundation. So when we're coming to the Bible, is the Bible the Word of God? You're wait, 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 wait. Wait a minute. You're assuming truth and you're assuming morality. And you've got to account for them before you can even begin, begin the debate. So let's maybe start at the very beginning. You said I have no basis for for logic or no basis for truth as an atheist? Yes, yes. Well, I believe that we can determine the truth through scientific thinking. And the reason okay. why I believe that is because it works. And if there's a better method that works, science will figure it out and it will become a part of the scientific method. There's no God okay. needed for that. And in fact, what oh. happens is as science progresses, it disproves all these God concepts, like, oh, God makes the world go around or something. We find out about gravity and all these other things. Okay. The more well, we learn I'm about science, the more we learn about how the Bible is ancient superstitious. Okay. Uh, Thomas Nagel is an atheist. Um, He's been very troubled about evolution, been very, very troubled, and he's a, one of the major philosophers in America. He said, if I believe, the, if I go with evolution, he said, it destroys itself. And I've tried to bring that up to you before. Okay, but, 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 but wait a second. The, you say, you say if, if he doesn't believe in evolution, what does he believe in as an atheist? Listen, okay, let me just finish. Let me finish. If I said he's troubled. And it's trouble because it implodes on itself, which I tried to bring up with you before, because it's not a rational basis. That process is not rational. So therefore, when you try to be rational, rational your, your own foundation is irrational. And, mm -hmm. and uh, even an atheist like Thomas Nagel mentioned that. So when you're talking about science and uh, the development of science and all the rest of it, your whole foundation is irrational. It, it's, by, it's irrational. You, know, you, you, said, you said my foundation is irrational, but you never explained why. I don't believe it is irrational. I believe my, my, well, my position is rational. I believe yours is superstitious. Well, you've not, accounted, you've, not accounted, you've not accounted why you said in the last video that logic is immaterial, and you've not actually explained that yet. So, what do you know, the debate what's, what's so you've hard had? to explain about logic being immaterial? I mean, obviously logic is immaterial. It's not made out of electrons and protons. That's a concept. But are, you a, but are you a philosophical naturalist? Yes, of course. Yeah. So, 
is everything that you know physical. Not physical, it's natural. I mean, for example, no, energy, you, energy is not physical. Energy uh, does not have any protons or neutrons or anything. But according well, to if Einstein, you, if you, energy at the Big Bang created the matter. Well, you're not in, you're not in touch with the current current philosophy. If you look at if you go on the Stanford okay. University website, well, okay, um, well, um, look uh, at philosophic, if you look at philosophical naturalism, you know well, it's quite clear if you look at that and what the general scholarship with philosophy philosophy are in philosophical naturalism. Okay, well, we're we're the out gen, of the general the general. Uh, consensus of the philosophers who, who take that position uh, are primarily physicalists. Okay, well, we're, so, out of, we're out of time on this question. We had 10 minutes and we're 10 minutes is up. Okay. So we need to go to the next one and we need to focus on the topics and we also need to, instead of bringing up like four or five things, we have to bring up just like one subtopic to talk about because we're not going to have time to talk about three or four different things. Um, well, I, I think that they were they were central. The Bible the Bible talks about is is to talk about the Bible you have to talk about rationality. Okay, so now to we're about the Bible, you have to talk about Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the second topic. Are the gospels good historical sources for learning about the life of Jesus? So let's try to bring up one topic and talk about that. So okay. what would you like to say about that? Are the gospels good historical sources for learning about the life of Jesus? I would say yes. Uh, recent scholarship uh, by Richard Balcom and, and others have, have found that as you look at the genre of the literature of the Gospels, that the uh, historical biography. That's my first point. Well, I would say I would say obviously they're meant to be historical, but I would say it's it's fantasy. I mean, it's not. I don't I don't believe it's realistic to believe that Jesus walked on water or turned water into wine. Okay. Well. I think that the most important thing, couple of things is you're a, you're a philosophical naturalist, and that has a bearing on the way you look at the literature. And, but I was a Christian. You can see that. Yeah, but I was a Christian for a long time. Pardon? I was a Christian for a long time. I was a Christian almost all my life. For over 25 years, I was a born-again evangelical Christian. That, that's a subjective argument, sir. No, but you're saying you're, you're saying into, I going, have. We're going into the we're going into the scholarship the scholarship of uh, New Testament studies and historical Jesus studies. Raynan, Oltman, Jonas, Wise, Albert Schweitzer, the New Atheist. All of them have had presuppositions where they they've been inventing a Jesus of themselves. And if you're a philosophical naturalist, you're coming with a pre bent pre presupposition that's going to influence your understanding of the data. We need criteria, objective criteria, that we can assess the historical Jesus. Well, let me, so let I would me, like to ask well, you, what, is, what okay. is your historical criteria? Well, let me ask you a specific question about the Gospels. Well, I've asked you. I've asked you first. You need to answer. The specific criteria is to, when you want to look at a historical figure, you have to look at all available writings and any kind of evidence whatsoever. It could be writings. It could be artifacts. You can look at anything and, and then try to piece it together to see what makes the most sense. And oh, with the Gospels, with, hold on now, with the Gospels, for example, you have these Gospels, which Bart Ehrman, who's a Bible scholar, says they are actually written anonymously. Uh, Thomas Paine said, you know what, here's a woman who says, uh, I am a virgin, but I'm pregnant. And, not, and he says, you know what, you can believe that if you want to, that this woman is pregnant by God. But, you know, it's not even her saying it. It's somebody else writing that about them. It's hearsay about hearsay. And not only is it just hearsay, but we don't even know who wrote the Gospels. You know, the Catholic Church maybe okay. said it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the scholars will tell you they just they just put names on there. They don't know who wrote these Gospels. Well, you're, you're not you're not really in touch with the scholarship of the times, uh, Bernie. Um, but just just as a matter of interest, if you read if you read Sam Harris, Dawkins, Michael Onfray, the new atheist like Richard Carrier. Uh, people like that. Their methodologies are very subjective, and they're not really in touch with with, with current scholarship on historical Jesus studies. I asked you for a criteria, and you didn't know what the criteria were, like the criteria of similarity, things like that that you need to understand if you're going to be uh, competent in this scholarship. Well, well when you ask um, about criteria, what you're saying is there's. Are, are you saying there's no? This is what I think you're arguing. There is no original manuscript, and they have all these manuscripts from different times and places, and they try to piece them all together to find out what the original is. 
Is that what you're talking about for criteria? No, when I'm asking, we're, we're talking about we're talking about good historical sources. So, for example, when we're looking at the life of Jesus, right? We 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 use criteria like, for example, the criteria of multiple attestation. But all you so all you look, have all example, you have all you have for Jesus. Me, let me just finish. Let me finish because this is important. We can look, say, at the claim of the gospel that it says that Jesus died on a cross, for example. And then we can look at other sources outside the Bible, for example. We can look at um, Josephus and Tacitus. No, no, no. Because no, we have no, multiple no, attestation, we can say that, no. as Dominic Crossan said, he was a, a skeptic that come Jesus on. died on a cross. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, come on. Outside of the gospel, what yeah. evidence is there for the life of Jesus? Tell me one document well, outside the gospel. Tell me one. Well, that he died on a cross, for example, uh, uh, Victor uh, Gamay's uh, World Authority on Dead Sea Scrolls, who recently died, uh, talks about the scholarship. Wait a minute, the scholarship on Josephus. And there's a passage in Josephus that clearly states that Christ died on that cross. The vast majority of scholars would agree that that passage of where he says he died on the cross is genuine Josephus. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, okay, so you know it's you, not on my side. You know that you know there's uh, a you, with that. He okay. that. First first off, you know there's a part of Josephus that is fabricated, right? Where it talks about him being the the Messiah and all that stuff, right? Well, I know the scholarship on that on the Josephus passage very well, mm -hmm. and I can tell you now that the vast majority of scholars, there's three camps of scholars on, on Josephus. Let me, let me ask you the something about... Set, excuse, let me just finish, because okay. people need to hear about the scholarship, because the atheists don't like people to know the full scholarship of it. If you look at the scholarship, there's a small percentage on the left that say it's not Josephus, that it was all in, put in by some monk of the 3rd century. Then on the right, there are, there are a few scholars that say that it's fully Josephus, but the bulk of scholarship would say that most of that passage about Jesus is Josephus, and that passage in particular about the cross is clearly Josephus. Well, the scholarship, sir. Let me ask you a question about Josephus. Was Josephus an eyewitness of all this? Um, Josephus, if you look at, the, you've got to look at context. If you look at the first century, and if you read uh, Josephus' book on his historical method, and you look at how historians worked in the first century, they based their work off Polybius, which was 200 B.C. 200 B.C., Polybius said, if you're going to be a historian, use eyewitness material. So Josephus, as a first century historian, mimicking Polybius, would try to get as much eyewitness material as he possibly could. And if you read Josephus, his scholarship is absolutely vast. Okay, let me, vast. let me, let me, the, the most you can say, okay, number one, Josephus was not an eyewitness, right? I, w I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't say he was an eyewitness, but I would say as a historian, he knew that it was important, okay. it was vital. What I'm trying to, to say, though, is... Minute, if to base his material on eyewitnesses... I understand that. multiple attestations... I understand that. He based it on Polybius. I understand that, but we agree that Josephus was not an eyewitness, correct? It was not an eyewitness, but that doesn't negate what he's saying, and that it doesn't I'm just negate seeing what, what was... I'm just seeing what we could agree with so far. We agree that he was not an eyewitness, right? He wasn't an eyewitness, okay. although he came and from jo Galilee, and, Josephus, and he lived about the time just after Jesus. Josephus says nothing at all about changing water into wine, uh, says nothing at all about Jesus walking on the water, all that stuff. All he says is that there is a guy named Jesus who is crucified, he does, not, he does not say Jesus rose from the dead, obviously, because Josephus would not believe that. So, I mean, no, at, at he, the best, all no, he's... But, at no, the best, all... Said, jo no, well, let me say something. Let me, let, let me just say You've something. You've got to be intellectually honest. Okay, Bernie, hold on. Question. Can I say you something? You said, give me one fact. And I gave you one fact. Okay. And that is that Christ died on a cross, and I'm giving you Josephus. And the vast majority of scholars don't disagree with it. And the basis of Josephus is based on eyewitness material, because that's how... He and first century writers tried to uh, do their writing. They tried to have multiple attestations. Yeah. It's quite remarkable if you look into the methods. It's, no, it's not a big deal at all that uh, Jesus died on the cross. There's lots of false messiahs that were killed on the cross. That's not something rare. That's okay, not something which unique. One? So you just claim which one? Which one? Um, you said lots have died on the cross. Which yeah. one? Yeah, there's a link. Well, I'm not sure. Uh, 
This is just what I heard. I'm not sure about all the it's crucifixions. Not, yeah, well, we can't go. But I, but I can't. I can't. Holy, hold on. Let me talk. Let me finish. Holy, let me finish. Holy, holy shit, bro. Let me finish. I can tell you there are a whole bunch of uh, false messiahs. You can find them on the internet. And one I was going to bring up. I was going to bring up. I've looked at them all, and they're significantly different from Jesus. There's you a, can go into detail about it if you want. Well, of course they're different than Jesus, but there's one guy who like led a rebellion for a couple years too, and the Romans came out and slaughtered them all. There's a whole bunch of false Jewish messiahs. That that Did part he die is on the odd. What's that? Rise again. Uh, dying on the cross, killing on the cross was a typical Roman crucifixion procedure for death penalty. There's two other people, even in the, in the gospel, there's two other people with him. They weren't claiming to be Messiah. They were killed on the cross. There's people, all kinds of people were killed on the cross. So well, Jesus, Michael, Jesus, Michael was Onfrey, a, Jesus was, an atheist, uh, Jesus was, 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 uh, he's a major philosopher in France. Uh, I'm, Andre, just saying, French according, I'm just saying, according in, in to the, the atheist, can I finish? Can I finish? In an atheist manifesto, said Jesus' existence has not been historically established, and then he says that nobody died on a cross in first century uh, uh, Jerusalem. That's a major French philosopher. That's the typical scholarship of atheists, and not okay. grounded in what's happening in modern scholarship on historical Jesus studies. Okay, so I just wanted to, we're out of time on this one too, but I just want to say that Josephus is not an eyewitness and all he's doing at best is reporting what other people have told to him. And he's, he's, not, he's not verifying anything of the gospel. All the gospel stories, he has nothing to do with that. Well, well I asked you for attestation, historical attestation method and you didn't really understand what that was about. And secondly, I gave you cut to get solid scholarship on Josephus. Primary source detail and then I gave you the cutting edge scholarship. And what you've given us, you said people died on the cross, but it was very nebulous. You didn't give any information or detailed information. Josephus doesn't say anything about the life of Jesus. Okay, that, that's an assertion, sir. Of course, he doesn't. He, Josephus doesn't talk about Jesus changing water in the wine. There's all these stories in the gospel. Je, Josephus doesn't say anything about those whatsoever. Bernie, Bernie, bro, I love you, mate. I admire, I respect you. But Think about it. What you're saying. What is the basic? What is the basic Christian message? It is about Jesus Christ dying on the cross. That's the major thing. No, 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 no. The major thing is he rose from the dead. Bernie, Bernie, please let me finish. The and the dead, yeah. But the the point what I'm getting at is the basic plausibility structure. The mathematician. Uh, I think it's Hacking, Professor Hacking, uh, talks about plausibility structure. If you've got a good plausibility structure, then your historical, uh, your historical data is good, and, and there's a good plausibility structure that he died on a cross, and, 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 and you're not following the scholarship that's on that particular topic. Okay, so we need to move on to the next topic now. Uh, this next topic is... Uh, does Christianity provide a basis for science? So what do you want to say about that? Um, I would say that, um, just trying to get my notes. I mean, I would, I, say, that, okay. I would say that Christianity uh, provides the basis for science in, in terms of the structure, um, that um, you know the laws of causality and and, and things like that. If if God is uh, if if the assumption is that God has created the world and set in motion, then it gives a reason why there are these laws. That these laws are not just going to dis disappear tomorrow. So it it gives you an account for um, uh, causality. And secondly, the Christianity, for, for for my understanding, being in seminary. Two seminaries. One seminary was liberal, where there were gay lecturers, where there were people attacking the Bible. And for me, Christianity teaches me to study widely and to investigate. And you can see throughout history, Christians have, have, have encouraged scholarship. And, and so I don't see any problem about science and about hmm, wow. people not, not wanting to be involved in science or promote science. Okay, well, let me, let me, let me just address you right there. I mean... To me, I think it is, it's, it's kind of hilarious to, to, hear you, to hear Christians say they have no problem with science, and yet 
they have these big problems with science. For example, all of modern biology, which is firmly accept of, uh, accepting evolutionary theory that humans evolved from other animals, and you reject that. So here you are wanting to say that, you know, basically thank God for science, because of God we have science, but now you reject modern science. And you probably, if you're a young earther, if you believe the universe is 6,000 years old, you're off by a factor of 3 million. It's because it's about 18 billion years old. So it, it's, it's, it's just, it's kind of hilarious to say that you think Christianity is a form for science, but yet you deny modern science. Well, I don't demand, uh, whatever the, ever, for, for me, I'm not a scientist. So for me, I'm not, uh, that is not my professional basis. Me, it's historical Jesus business. Get me on that, I know what I'm talking about. But I've listened to eight of your talks, eight of your debates. I've listened to them carefully. And I've tried, I, it, it, in this day, I've tried, I've set aside a full day, I've tried to do a bit of research and a bit of study on the topic. So I can't even begin to fully address those issues. All I know is that from a mathematical point of view, mutation and the natural selection does not make sense. And even in recent research, if you study recent studies, on the rate of mutation and how mutations um, stay within within a gene pool, and and the problems that uh, scholarships recently having in that area, um, that the time factor for uh, a mutation to stay within it within a gene and, and to have a, a long term effect, uh, if you calculate the, the mathematical probability in in just one one uh, species, um, it the the, the uh, statistics go way bill, millions and billions uh, billions and billions of years beyond what current scientists think. So in other words, you've got problems with your model as well. No, it's no, not no, a no, clear no, no, no. That you're making. Well, this is not. Pardon? These calculations are not a problem with evolutionary theory. You cannot calculate or predict evolutionary changes. I mean, it has to do with isolation. Species change when they're isolated. The gene pool drifts. You can't calculate these things because they're made by they're, they happen by random events, migrations, uh, could be volcanoes, meteor hits, or whatever. I mean, you, you can't predict these things. So well, that's, you're, that's... you're making you're making. A, I mean, if you study the current research in in genetics and about about how mutations, if you just Google that and study recent current mathematical uh, models and uh, uh, the issue about mutation and the effect of mutation, yeah. the rate of mutation. If you study the current scholarship on that, there's about five or six different views, different papers that have been written recently. So not not by creationists, by but mainstream evolutionists. Well, and in that, um, just for one species, yeah. uh, it goes uh, uh, millions and millions. Uh, of years beyond what current uh, formulations are, so oh. and and they're all different. Some it's like astronomical bigger, astronomical smaller. In other words, the issue on mathematics and its relationship to mutation and natural selection. No, I, it, it's not I, a no. done deal. It's not as done as you are making it out to be in current scholarship. No, I, I think that's totally bogus. I mean, there there is a such it's thing not, as it's not bogus. Let me let me no, finish I, I now. Let me let me talk a little I've bit. Got... Let me let me say a bit no. now. I, I let you talk. Let me finish. Let me say a little bit. Sorry. Uh, you, it is true that you can calculate some things, like those molecular clocks. You can see how how things have changed over time. There's certain theories about that, but there's also things that are unpredictable, like horizontal gene transfer, where you can pick up totally foreign DNA. So, in other words, this is DNA in your genome that is not even passed down from descendants, and you, there's no way to calculate that. So, th and there could be all kinds of duplications too in the genome. There's, there's these things that happen that just you cannot calculate. So, that's why I think it's totally bogus to try to calculate okay. species Okay, well the chains. academic article, the academic article, because we, let's put a bit of substance on it. If you go to uh, John Sanford, uh, Wesley Brewer and Francis Smith, um, and uh, July, published 17th of September 2015, uh, and it's called the waiting time uh, problem in uh, model uh, hominin uh, something like that. But if, if you ta if you Google John Sanford and uh, Brewer and Smith on the waiting time problem, 
Uh, and, you know, that's just one article with many articles on that topic. And they're trying to base what they do know, not what they don't know. And you're quite right. There are, there are uh, factors that you, you can't calculate. But they're trying to work from what they do know, and from what they do know, uh, the, the statistics don't add up. And if, and if you take your argument, you know, you're using that argument uh, to try and get out of the problem. You're not using that argument uh, to actually engage with the scholarship. You're fighting the scholarship. You're using it to get out of the argument. Deal with what we know, and what we know is mutations and natural selection, mathematically speaking, when we start to apply it to how, mutation, uh, how mutations uh, uh, stay and, and affect species, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't add up from what they know, and they're doing minute research on these areas. Okay, you send me the link after the show, and I'll put it in the show notes. And um, okay, of course, I'll, I'll look no, at I'll, that. I'll, I'll, I'll have to do it later I, this afternoon. Yeah. as soon as I finish, I'm, I'm yeah. going to go to bed. Though. I mean, I, I have a feeling you're misrepresenting the data. If it's valid, if it's valid science, it may be invalid pseudoscience too. So I'm going to check it out. Okay. Um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, William Dembski is famous for talking about the odds of life arising and stuff like that. And I, I know the equations he's using are bogus because I've seen what he's done. And also Bart Rask, I've debated him. He, wrote a, not, he wrote a big book about it, and I and I can see how his his equations are bogus. And I see people repeating these arguments about how things are calculated, and all of them I've looked at so far, they're bogus. So well, Bernie, Bernie, you don't have to, you don't have to. Have Bernie, you're an intelligent guy with a degree in engineering. You don't have to, you don't have to be that smart. You're smart. It's just common sense. But I, no, I no, 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 it's not common minute. sense. Wait a minute. Nope. I've thought about this for, for years that, that that's been a problem. And when I went into studying it, because I've heard your lectures and debate, I went to study it for myself. I looked at the current scholarship. I was quite encouraged. And, 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 and glad to find that my, my own thinking as an ordinary person on the street is being confirmed by modern scholarship. Yeah, this stuff is not common science. This, this can be complicated things. I mean, it's like, you know, like quantum mechanics. People don't understand it, but they have to accept it even though it doesn't make sense. You well, know, I, 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 under, I understand it's hard to believe that we came from ape-like creatures and before that from fish. That is not common sense, but that's where the evidence leads. And so... You cannot appeal to common sense for for science. I mean, the common sense we would not think the Earth is spinning at something like sixty thousand miles per hour because we don't feel it. So there's in a lot the, of in the article. In the article, it says this: various yeah. researchers have examined the issue of waiting time okay. and approached the problem from different directions using different right. starting assumptions. So that's on one issue. Will you send me the link on that? Okay. Yes, certainly, sir. All right. Thank you. Um, so anyway, I, just in summary, I, I think it's kind of I, I think it's kind of amazing that you would say thank God for thank God that He created science. Science owes everything to God, and yet here we have modern science, and Christians such as yourself deny it. Like modern evolutionary theory is modern science, and you saying you're saying that's bogus, and, and yet your this is modern is, science. Your, your main argument that you based evolution on has been about chromosome two or something like that. I've just given, I've, I'm only a layman, you studied it in more detail, but I've just tried to look at the current scholarship on one particular area, and I'm finding problems. I'm not coming at this as a person who wants to prove uh, creationism. I just want to study, study current scholarship, and, and it's showing me that it's not as clear as you're making out okay. to be. Well, let me, let me ask you a question. Do you think it's a scientific fact that humans evolved from other animals? You, you need to qualify what you mean. Evolved. No, I don't. I said humans there's, evolved there's from other... There's, 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 evol there's evolution in time that we can see, and then there's evolution in species over long periods of time. So no, I'm, I'm talking specifically humans. Did humans evolve from other animals? From what I've just studied in current scholarship, it doesn't add up mathematically. Is it? So you're saying it is not a scientific fact that humans descended from other animals? From what I've just studied here, from what I've studied about mutations and how the variations okay. of mutations. Okay, well, I'm, I'm trying to tell you. It's it a, I'm trying up. to tell you it that it doesn't add up. I'm trying to tell you it is a scientific fact that humans descended from other animals. How did it happen? That is evolutionary theory. It's a theory, and it's but, always being revised. 
but how it Bernie, happened. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish, please. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Make a statement about something. Jason, let me finish. I ask you to back it up. Jason. You've not backed it up. All you, you're let just me finish. Assertions, man. Please, let me finish. I'm trying to say there's two points here. One point is it's a scientific fact that humans evolved from other animals. The second thing is how did it happen? That's evolutionary theory and it's constantly being re revised. For example, horizontal gene transfer is another thing that kind of came in with um, descent and modification. So the, the complexity, what, how it actually happened is evolutionary theory, but, th but that it happened is a fact. And if you don't believe that humans descended from other animals, then you are not in modern science. And so that's why I think it's no, a joke Bernie, to say you, you that's, that's, that that's why I think it's a joke you for you to say me, that let me, let me, Christianity let brought us modern science and yet you deny Bernie, the, you sound, the Bernie, current state of finish. modern science. Bernie, let me come in. You sound like a modern prophet or something, just banging on, banging on. You, you failed to give us any data. I know you're going to say chromosome, whatever, but you've not given us any data. You just said fight, 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 but no data. I've given you current scholarship in a particular area. No, you area. haven't. No, You've you just gave... you that. Show me some current You gave one criticism... That shows what no. you're saying. No, you gave one criticism of evolutionary theory, but every... Like, for no, example, in the United States, every single university teaches that humans evolved from other animals. Every single university, no exceptions whatsoever, state universities. No, the, the okay, problem, so it's established fact. The theory of science, that science just doesn't stand still, it moves on. And this current scholarship in the mathemat in the, this current scholarship in the mathematical implications of the mutation rate on the wait in time it, it is very dangerous and and it, and is strategic. And if if the current scholarship is correct, mm. it makes all the stuff that you're claiming nonsense. Okay. Next, the next topic is who was Jesus. What do you want to say about that? Uh, I would say that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, you know, like C.S. Lewis was famous for saying there's a three L's, there's a liar, lunatic, or Lord, and some other people later on said le legend is another possibility, and that's what I believe, is that maybe there was a guy who claimed to be Messiah, maybe he was crucified, but uh, I believe all the Gospels are just legend, you know, like it, it never happened. Jesus walking mm -hmm. on the water, um, all the miracle stories, I believe they're just legend. Like I said, you know, I'm wearing this Harry Potter shirt. I, everybody knows Harry Potter is a fictional story. Everybody knows Star Wars is a fictional story. I believe the Gospels are totally fiction. And we, for example, we agree, we agree the Book of Mormon is total fiction, probably, right? And also like um, Muhammad splitting the moon and putting it back again, that's total fiction. I just disagree with you about the Bible. I think the Bible is also total fiction in the same way. Okay, can I come in now? Sure. If you look at Luke chapter 1, it says, verse 1, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are more surely believed among us, then it says, um, Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, the Greek word eyewitness there, comes from uh, the same Greek word as eyewitness that Polybius used in 200 B.C. Polybius is a historian in 200 B.C., Greek historian, who believed that if you're going to be a good historian, you use eyewitness material. First century historians tried to copy Polybius. He was a household name amongst first century historians. Luke is using the same Greek word for eyewitnesses of Polybius. In other words, he's trying to base his scholars, his writing, on eyewitness material. So your whole Harry Potter argument falls to the ground because if you look at the genre of Luke, for example, he's trying to do history like Polybius. Well, I would say Luke is trying to... The has been on, it's come to the, 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 to, to for the last uh, 15 years and, and, and you know, it, it, it's still not... It's still in debate and discussion now. Well, I know Luke is trying to portray it as history, but his number one goal, I think, is also to convince people that Jesus is the Messiah. So it's, I mean, the whole story there is, is really designed to uh, convert people. And like I said, uh, Bart Ehrman said that uh, these Gospels are anonymous. So you can say Luke wrote this if you want to, but according to the modern scholars, it seems like if they're honest, they, they would say they don't actually know who wrote it. They don't even know if Luke wrote it. 
So when you're saying well, Luke Rota, you're actually just assuming something there. That, that's a that's a particular end of scholarship, a particular uh, school of thought. Um, you know, all history, all history, uh, is is not fully objective. Every historian, every thinker, everybody who comes to history will come with their own bias. Uh, so you'll come with you're a you're a philosophical naturalist, so you'll come with it. Luke has got his bias, but Luke is stating that it, it you know. Um, the Jews are biased about, for example, um, the, the, uh, the Holocaust. But it doesn't mean to say it didn't happen. It doesn't mean to say they're not reporting it correctly. You know, Luke is trying to give eyewitness account. But, yeah, he has his own particular uh, methodology, uh, his own particular way of looking at things, just like Richard Carrier has or just like you have or just like I have. But at the same time, we can get to data. We can get to evidence. We've just got to be critically aware of our bias. But I think if we're honest, though, I mean, it sounds to me like we don't even know Luke wrote it. You're making an no, assumption that's, there that Luke ridiculous. wrote it. No, if you look at if you look at if you look at the scholarship, it's quite clear um, that you know you can look at Irenaeus, you look at uh, Papias, you look at uh, the other church fathers. The gospels clear, clearly spread across the ancient world. It was unprecedented, and you know, in those days. They, they, the way manuscripts were written, uh, they found manuscripts on, in Pompeii, which verifies this, is that, you know, the, the name, the, the names were, were, uh, labels were put on the manuscripts, and then those labels would end up, uh, falling off. So there would be a tradition passed on of who wrote that, of who wrote that, uh, that book. That, that was the, that was the way manuscripts were done. So it would be very clearly, uh, clear who, who wrote those? Uh, who wrote those gospels? And and uh, and the argument is is strengthened by the Gnostic gospels, who who use key people like Peter and John as synonymous names. Obviously, that's showing you that there was authoritative names before um, before the Gnostic gospels. Also, the Gnostic gospels are trying to mimic, mimic the uh, four gospels. Also, the four gospels mention Jerusalem seventy times, where uh, the Gnostic Gospels don't. What that shows you is the four Gospels are much, much earlier in their time frame uh, than, mod than many modern scholars want to agree. And also, Bob Ehrman is a particularly uh, influenced by a certain school of thought that looks at manuscripts from a particular biased perspective in the philosophy of manuscript uh, development. But you've got to be careful. If you don't know that, you would think he was trying to be objective, but he's actually being very subjective in his way of, of dealing with text. Okay, well, um, I would just, I'll just uh, advise the viewer to look at what Bar Derman says. He says this, this is, these Gospels are anonymous. We don't know who they are. So they can look at, people can look at, at that as one claim and look at your counterclaim that scholars do know who these are and we can research this offline. So we only have can about... Can I just have one last thing, Bernie? One yeah, thing. really quickly, because we only have 10 minutes left. In, in academics, uh, I studied in two seminaries, liberal and evangelical. And, I, and, and it's been 10 years in academic study, listening to theologians. And I can tell you this, authoritatively, that whenever you're studying a theologian, whoever it is, you'll always have an agenda. And Bart Herman has an agenda. You need to find out his presuppositions and his philosophical bias when he's doing his scholarship. Okay, let's move on to the next subject. We have less than 10 minutes now. Okay, um, so this last question is, uh, is the gospel relevant today in the modern world? Um, like I wrote in my book, uh, my, my booklet is called Modern Science and Philosophy Destroy Christian Theology. Um, can I, I'd like to read a pass, just a paragraph from my booklet and see what you have to say about that, okay? Okay. Okay, I said, uh, here's a way to basically phrase the gospel. It's, it's silly, but it's actually factually true. So, okay, here it goes. God, who knows all things past and present, made humans. But it turns out that humans are sinners, and this stirs up God's wrath, even though he knew it would happen before it did, because God's all-knowing. How could this situation be fixed? Well, God, who is all-knowing, decided to come to earth and sacrifice himself to appease himself, because Jesus is God's son and he's also God, the same being, because there's only one God in mono, monotheism. In summary, God sacrificed himself to appease his own wrath. And God, who is immortal, died on a cross and came back to life, which is a contradiction, of course. And here's the icing on the cake. If you know and reject this message, for example, because the message is nonsense, you will be tortured in hell for eternity. So, I mean, basically, I, I think the gospel is totally nonsense that 
God sacrificed himself to appease himself. It's, I mean, the whole thing is just goofy. Okay. Benny, I, love, Benny, I hope we can meet up and talk, man, because, you know, the more I'm getting to know you, the more I'm getting to uh, love and, and respect you, mate, and I'd love to talk to you more. But as you would say in your debates and discussions, you know, facts, 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 that's what you often say, you know, and we've got to deal with facts. In 1 John chapter 1, it says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and shown to you that the eternal life which we said the Father and was manifested in us, but which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And the fact is that Christ made a claim that he would die on a cross, and he died on that cross, and now you've got to assess whether you agree with his assessment that he is the Son of God or not. But the fact is that he did die as a claimed Messiah. Let me, let and, me ask you a question you know, about that. Wait, wait, let me just finish. Let me just finish. And for me, I believe that his claim is true. I, I believe when I look at his life, when I look at the Gospels, I don't see, I see someone um, that it would be more a miracle. It, you know, the four Gospels would have to be compared to four Shakespeare's, you know, four great writers making up a person, it seems more incredible to believe that than to believe that he is the Son of God. And, you know, secondly, they you, copied you assume from each rationality, other. you assume morality about, about these things, which you've never been able to uh, account for. Well, and thirdly... No, 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 come on, know, we, can't, we can't bring I, up I one, two, three things. We, on. we only have a few minutes here. Sorry, bro. L let, me, let me ask you, do you believe that, you talked about Jesus dying on the cross, do you believe that Jesus... Before he came to earth, he existed in heaven eternally? Yes, I believe in the and, Trinity, yes. And, and do you believe that Jesus knew the future, knows everything that's going to happen? Well, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he was in the beginning, and then he says, and the Word, verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us. Right, right. Was, Jesus, was Jesus in heaven, though, before he was born on earth, was he in heaven and he knew all of the future because he's all-knowing? Is that true? He, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he was the Word, he was God. And he knew the future while it, before he came to earth, is that true? Well, he was God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus knew the future, right? That's what, well, he's God, I've just said it. Okay, it's so... It's interesting, though. Wait a minute. I'll answer, but it's interesting you're throwing all these questions now, but I'll, I'll, I'll Because I'm I'll, leading I'll, up I'll to something. Before. I'm trying to lead Sorry? up to something. If Jesus knew, if Jesus is God, and he knew everything before it happened, he knew he was going to die and come back to, come back, I mean, I don't know how a God could even die because they're supposed to be immortal, but supposedly he knew in advance he was going to die and everything was going to work out, and yet here he's supposed to be in the garden fretting over it. How, why would he fret about it if he already knew it was going to happen and it was already a success and all that? Bernie, Bernie, I love you, mate, and I respect you, but Bernie, you know, it, it says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. That's, that's in terms of the, the Spirit. When, but it says in Philippians chapter 2, it talks about he became, you know, he, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation and humbled himself even to death at the cross. So the, the, the God became a man, so he's human. That's why you wept at the at the, uh, the at the the grave of Lazarus. Now I don't, I I can't fully explain. Uh -huh. I know that you're going to say it's a cop out, no. but I can't fully explain how the ink, that God eternal can become a man in terms of two natures in one person. For me, even in physics, there's what is called uh, amongst physicists the boundary of the unknowable. There's a point at which we we can't know. There's, there's that boundary, and when the infinite comes to the finite. It's beyond our conception. But the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus was a human as well as, as God. And, you know, and so that he wept. Well, the, and he was in the garden. Yeah. And, and, he, and, and he was struggling. Well, the, 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 the mystery, the complexity is because there's philosophical inconsistencies. I mean, if you say God is all-knowing and Jesus is fully God, and yet he doesn't know the future, he doesn't know... I mean... Obviously, Jesus didn't know it. I mean, Jesus, 
what kind of God is this? Here he is, a little baby. He, he doesn't even know how to walk or talk. He's a toddler. What kind of God is this? At some point, I mean, he never does. I, I don't know. At some point, does he ever say, oh, wow, I just got all awareness. I know everything. Or he never did. I mean, if, if he's actually limited, then he's not really fully God. It's kind of like, it's like Mike Tyson is one of the best boxers ever, but you take away his boxing skill, he's no longer Mike Tyson. If you take away okay. God's all-knowing capabilities, he's no longer God. And well, can, that's the I problem. You're in, trying to can say I, Jesus is I, fully God and fully man, but yet he's not, but yet he's somehow limited. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll let, I've, I've, I've given you a good go, so I've let you throw a few, few punches at me, bro. I mean, I, um, I, I think it's amazing that, I mean, and, and Jesus, here's Jesus. Okay, like, was Jesus ever sick? I mean, he goes around healing people. Okay, well, you know, he's going to heal people with uh, even bringing people back to, to death, like Lazarus. Well, he probably never had a flu. He probably never even had a headache, never had a migraine. A migraine is a pain in the head, okay? So he never even had a pain in the head. So now we're to believe that, so, so now we're to believe that he was tortured and whipped and everything, and it, it gave him tremendous pain. Well, how do we know? If he's really God and he could take away pain, maybe he didn't feel anything. Maybe he, he just faked it. Why would you? Ernie, I mean, all this Ernie, stuff doesn't make sense. Ernie, I love you, mate, but it's all over, mate. It's all finished. I'm, I'm letting you run these punches on me, but it's all over. You've not explained rationality. You've not explained morality. These are a last desperate attempts, and I can answer these. What we're talking about uh, is by the... Christian theology. If you, if you read Philippians chapter two, it says that he made himself of no reputation, and, and, and there was a, and on, there was a veiling of the Godhead, I know. and that he came and humbled himself. And that passage helps to answer those questions, so it encourages you. No, questions. it does not. It does. But the question, wait a minute, the questions that Bernie's throwing, read Philippians 2 in the light of those questions. It doesn't answer anything, because you're saying Jesus was fully God, but then you're saying he was limited, so that means he was not God. No, the, you have to understand the purpose and the plan of why he became incarnate. He became incarnate because... It says in Romans 5, by one man's disobedience, many became unrighteous. By one man's obedience, many become righteous. So he's becoming, he's, he's coming on our behalf. And on our behalf, he had to be human. He had to, he had to be the person who was going to be our chief, our head, to take, to take our punishment. And so therefore, he had to be a human being. So he is a human okay. being, but he's also, he had to be God, because the sin that you and I commit, has infinite implications. So th th there was a veiling of that Godhood. He was 100% God and 100% man, but there was a veiling of the Godhood in that some of that Godhood we were not allowed to see. Okay, well, the uh, human I, side. Jason, actually, we're out of time now. The show's over. So I just want to say thanks for calling in. Um, we didn't get through very much, but thanks for calling in. Bernie, thanks, mate. I hope we keep in touch, mate. Okay.